Engagement is obviously a vital ingredient of um, growing a successfully employee-owned business. Episode 123. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am talking to architect Eva Lennart and building surveyor Alex Holton, who both are members of the team at Purcell. So Purcell started life as an architectural practice founded by the conservation expert Donovan Purcell in the 1940s, and they've got a rich history and legacy of working on some of the UK's most important heritage assets uh, with buildings in cultural, educational and institutional sectors. Since the 1940s, the practice has grown to a 250 person team which is split across offices right across the UK Um, and I got the opportunity to sit with Alex who as I said is an associate building surveyor and he specializes with many of the heritage building services that Purcell offers to their clients and Ava is an architect who has a vast array of experience working with cultural projects. So both Alex and Ava discuss with me the growth and evolution of Purcell and how the business is structured and how they are preparing for its succession as it moves forward to becoming an employee owned business. So sit back, relax and enjoy Alex Holton and Ava Leonard. Alex and Eva, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you both? Very well, thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having us, Ryan. My pleasure. So, Alex, you're in York and Eva, you're in London, is that correct? Correct. Correct, yeah. Brilliant. And you're both um, at Purcell Architecture. Um, I suppose the first question is, could you tell me a little bit about both your individual roles in Purcell and a bit of a bit about the practice, a bit about the history of the practice. Uh, yeah, sure. So perhaps uh, we can start just outlining the practice. So Purcell Architects, uh, actually, we are one of the largest and oldest um, companies right now on the UK market. Uh, we have workforce workforce of over two hundred um, employees, very talented employees ac- around the globe. Right. with over 10 regional studios in the UK, but we are also present in Asia Pacific. We have an office in Hong Kong, two hubs in Australia, Melbourne and Sydney, and we are also present in Tasmania. Um, so um, we, we could say that we specialize in a creative conservation and reuse of listed buildings. And we have some like stunning portfolio of one of the London's uh, most fabulous sites, including currently National Portrait Gallery, National Gallery. Um, We are in the framework of Battersea Power Station, Manchester Town Hall, and many other uh, fantastic projects um, across the globe. And um, what I think is really special about Purcell, that beyond caring about delivering projects to highest standard, Mm -hmm. we also really, really care about the way we uh, conduct our practice, the way we run um, a very collaborative culture within. And we really care also about the sustainability ethos um, in general terms. Brilliant. And, 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 and how do your, yours and Alex's roles differ? Because I understand that you're an architect and Alex, you've got a slightly different background. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm a surveyor and heritage consultant by um, trade, I suppose. Um, but all of that's founded on a love of heritage places historic buildings and cultural sites and so on. So my role, as it were, has grown quite organically um, and I just enjoy engaging with great buildings and seeing them either repaired or reused or extended or developed and, and keeping all of that going. And, and there's a lot of that that ties with Purcell itself as a company, not just in what it does, mm. but itself having a very sort of rich and interesting heritage back to the 1940s, which... Um, sort of introduces partly why um, we wanted to transition to an employee-owned company, which I'm sure we'll come on to. But yes, so I'm a surveyor and an associate. I work mainly around the north, but sometimes I'm lucky enough to move around the UK and, and get to work on on other sort of um, places outside of my my sort of territory. Um, and then Eva, um, who's slightly younger to the practice, has a different role down in London, southeast. 
Got it. Fantastic. And Eva, how, how, what is your role in the practice? So I'm an architect. Um, I'm based in London and I've been with Parcel for almost three years. And since then, I've been working predominantly on regeneration schemes in London. Mm. Currently, uh, one scheme is in North London, one is in Fulham. So it's mostly dealing with very sensitive sites uh, where the client would come to us, which on the site would be heritage buildings. And sometimes it's all about understanding the context and preservation of the existing buildings, giving them new life, and very often adding um, new built parts, which mm -hmm. work sensitively with, with the current context. And what I think Alex already touched base on, that what's actually quite special about Parcel, that we, um, we are not only architects, there are so many master planners, designers, heritage consultants, um, surveyors, and people with so many different backgrounds, and we often provide service to clients, not only in architecture, but often on advising on heritage assets and how, how to deal with them and what's the best way to, to um, tackle those issues. Got it. Um, so just uh, stepping back a little bit, how, how did the practice begin? So um, the practice began in 1947, um, led by um, Donovan Purcell. And um, that was a practice based in the east of England, um, working on sites such as Ely Cathedral um, and grew its base there and also with a studio in Norwich. And that still is one of our home studios, the Norwich studio. Ah. So that itself had a sort of ripple effect post-war. There was obviously a lot of um, major development going on after World War II. Um, and there was a balancing act to be done between development and also um, maintaining the integrity of special places, heritage places. It was in the midst of buildings getting listed um, and the growth of the conservation area and so on and charters on heritage and protecting cultural assets. Mm. So within that, Donovan Purcell and his team were able to carve out a sort of niche route as other similar architects were at the time who were of a similar mind mm. um, to, to actually almost self-invent an industry in managing heritage works but the practice quickly diversified as well and we did a lot of work with the MOD um, housing clients and so on and, and then grew to quite a substantial practice over that time with um, studios um, growing out of the um, out of the east of England. Got it got it and, and so that the the work that you do nowadays you're involved with uh, an, you know a number of kind of large infrastructure type clients quite um, quite complex multi-headed clients that you're that you're dealing with now how, how is the office set up um and structured to be able to cater to to the sort of large diversification of portfolio of work that you have um we are the office by itself is divided by regions right we have um five main regional um studios um we have london and southeast west east and north of england and Asia Pacific, which covers Hong Kong, uh, Australia, and Tasmania office. So it's it's not like, in, I think most of the architectural companies, there will be like head of housing, head of hospitality of culture projects. We are more focused um, and circle around the regions and how certain partners engage in the projects. It also, I wouldn't say that we so strongly divide in sectors. Most of right. our work, we mostly focus about dealing with existing context and create and adding value to it so we are not so strongly divided with sec sectors um, and how office grows it it grows quite organically if you observe it mostly whenever we have a new work we would um, and start a hub there and the offices tend to grow organically uh, the same happened with Hong Kong we right. um, initially our first big project was um, Hong Kong Police Station mm -hmm. that we've been collaborating with Herzog de Moron. And since then the hub um, grew organically. The same happened with Australia and Tasmania. Um, I think it's a quite interesting uh, business model allowing a lot of studios um, to form and, and expand. So how, how, this is quite interesting. When I, when I speak to practices that I've diversified or, or set up studios internationally as well, there's a kind of, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of level of complexity that goes into, into doing that. How has Purcell um, been able to set up those studios? Do you often, do you take talent from the UK and then 
put it in or do you often find it locally? How does, how does it work? It's, um, it's probably a combination really. It begins quite often with an opportunity, just as Eva said on, um, mm. on, on a Hong Kong project, it began with an opportunity and a partner being able to sort of work, work through that and secure that wonderful project that we've had there running for, for several years now. And then what we'll tend to do, depending on what the client needs really, is bring together a team that might be a combination of um, expertise from the UK that we've been able to almost take and sell um, to the client as being, you know, uh, good people to mm. deliver their project um, equally. Um, and as we've done in Hong Kong and in other places where we've set up studios, we'll also look to um, secure um, talent in, in the places where we've set up the studios. And um, perhaps a more recent one for us was Manchester, where a key headline project that we secured um, shortly after establishing our Manchester studio was the Manchester Town Hall project. And that's been very much driven by social value and employing very locally from um, the point of the design team right through to now the contractor team on site. So we'll always have a view to grow a studio in a location. We may move some talent from one part of the business to another, right. but hopefully it creates its own self-sustaining entity that's drawn from its, its local market. And has the, the niche of kind of been, uh, you know, specialists in, in heritage as well, when exporting that internationally, that's quite, that's really fascinating because obviously there's a, a sort of niche of heritage buildings within the UK. Um, how has that sort of been appropriated or, or, or sold abroad or, or seen as a, a kind of a very a specialist thing that's, that would work in other countries as well? I think it's a very good question, but we are also <clears throat> lucky how the, the way the practice developed over the years. Um, we've been in the framework of the most stunning heritage sites um, in the UK, including um, Elizabeth Tower, currently commonly known as Big Ben, um, National Portrait Gallery, National Gallery. So we have a portfolio of dealing with not only the most um, special British heritage sites, but at the same time, they are also one of the most special world um, heritage sites, so to say. Yeah. And the way we approach, I think, dealing with the sensitive sites and a lot of things is also in the end technical knowledge, which you can easily transfer to other countries. Mm -hmm. So one thing is dealing with context, right? We would say pre-planning, working till stage three, how we approach um, building sitting in the context. Of course, there's a lot of uh, planning regulations, understanding local context. But even every country, I think, have a, have a bit different planning, obviously different regulation. Still the ethos we have, how the building um, reacts to environment and vice versa, it, it is a trans transferable knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and, and obviously on the technical skill set, um, on the, even from the details of repairs and how we're dealing with the fabric on its own, I feel this knowledge, it is a very transferable and it's not, it, it's universal, so to say. Right. right. It, it's, 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 um, those, yeah, they're what they're world heritage sites that are very appropriate for, um, for mm -hmm. numerous locations. Um, how, how is the business, you were saying there's, there's about 200, of you guys that's over quite... yeah over 200 i don't know right now the um uh, the exact number but it's yeah it's it's between 200 to 150 people right now got it and and how is it in, how is it structured internally in terms of like is there a hierarchy or is it much more of a flat open kind of structure in the business and like you know sort of small studios within a large organization how is it managed and organized um, so at the moment, um, we've moved from a limited liability partnership into um, a limited um, company. And right. that's all part of our preparation for employee ownership, which, um, of course, we'll move on to in, in due course. Um, but the way that that um, what is now the Architecture Limited Co is set up is that we have um, a board that oversees the practice as a whole drawn from the different regions so each of our regions is represented at board level. And then we have right. a chair and a CEO who are also the current owners of Purcell and who will be transferring their ownership over to us under the employee ownership transition. 
So we have that board that acts as the sort of top level strategic direction to the business and then reporting to those regional partners that are within the board we then have studio partners around the country with each of our studios and they lead each studio and work collaboratively together to um, generate and help deliver our our work and then working with the partners we then have the associates senior architects surveyors heritage consultants and so on in the more probably pyramidal form that you might expect an architectural studio to be set up to deliver its work. However, as we move towards EO, the ambition, although there'll be different roles and responsibilities through the business, is that we generate a much flatter culture of flatter ethos, where right. everyone is sort of built into leadership and management. Everyone is accountable and we're all working to that common EO goal. So I think now's probably a, a good a good uh, point to move into the conversation about the employee ownership structure because I think this is really interesting um, and breeds a very unique business culture uh, and can be potentially very empowering. How has this idea come about and what does it what does it mean for Purcell? Okay I'll take that bit first if you want ever and then um, follow on. Um, well, it's, it's been a way, really, of thinking through how we succession plan as a business. Mm. Um, and with changing times, changing markets, um, it's become increasingly difficult for architecture practices generally to work their way through succession planning. Um, there's great, young, talented people out there that are brilliantly capable of running and leading studios, but their capacity to buy in to buy their stake in a sort of equity led business has become increasingly out of reach. Yeah. So I expect Purcell found itself in a similar situation where it was um, under a previous equity led model, yet it was going to be increasingly different, difficult for the sort of people coming through the business to, to realistically access that model. So there was one question there, how do we retain talent? How do we bring people through to leadership of the business rather than them saying, well, I'd love to do that, but I can't actually afford it and I need to head off out here, out here and do my own thing. So that was one area. Another one was going back to that point earlier in this conversation about the, the interest and the integrity of Purcell as a business mm. and finding a way of protecting that integrity to safeguard what we think is a great business, a great brand, something that has depth that goes a long way back um, that while we still think forward, we're all quite um, sort of attached to Purcell, what it means and the work that it's done over the years and how we can use that going forward. So in a way to sort of safeguard the business um, and rather than see it sold off to, you know, a bigger sort of third party company um, and looking at all of those options of sale, it seemed one of the most credible routes to explore was employee ownership to protect Purcell and, and make it and keep it independent from those external forces. And so it began that journey um, in 2016 when something that the business calls and we call collective ambition, which was our strategic business plan, was first drafted. So um, we've been on the journey of transitioning um, in the long form for several years now that's when the seeds were planted right and now we're gradually getting into the detail of of making the move and completing the move what what sorts of things have you needed to be considering in in, in your preparation to make the transition so i i feel it's um when you think about eo employee-owned company model it is all about giving voice to people having um the more informed our employees, the more involved they are. Right. And it's about right to information and giving also people permission to change and get involved. So by default, it gives, uh, it promotes a proactive and collaborative environment. And um, I feel it's a very like 21st century model of having more um, flat hierarchy mm -hmm. and giving people platform to getting involved because if directly um, your your company is depending uh, dependent on you right like how much you give how much you get and it gives you ability to influence and um, when Alex said about for instance collective ambition I feel Parcel 
it's we already have had very collaborative culture and as much as we have obviously on some sort of uh, hierarchy as you need to have in the professional field still our structural feels quite flat meaning um you you are in direct connection with i think with the board we have the system in place which is called um Hercel voice when every quarter every month people in different studios meet and they discuss the issues they would like to be raised by the board mm -hmm. and this is being directly communicated uh, to the board so it gives you uh, the possibility to uh, raise your raise your concerns in the collective ambition document which is released every year uh, by the board um, and um, it's outlined our short and long-term goals in the company. And as the title describes, it's, a, it's about having collective ambition. As every person has um, their own career path and development, it's also how we develop um, globally. And I think board is quite open to hearing uh, opinions and voices also from the youth and all levels of leadership. And by it, um, we naturally form the new leadership tier that will be um, uh, forming, let's say, natural su succession planning. And the whole model of EO is very beautiful and, it, and it's great. Mm -hmm. However, the whole transition of forming the, um, um, the trust, it's, it also costs money, right? Yeah. So um, because it's such an innovative and collaborative, <laughs> because it's such an innovative um, um, model, it is supported by um, UK's government. Currently, um, employee-owned companies in, in the UK are contributed, contributing um, 30 billion pounds um, to the UK's GDP. And how the government promotes it is in 2014, uh, the budget introduced two major reforms uh, that encourage companies to transfer to this model. Um, firstly, um, all the ta capital uh, tax gain from forming uh, the trust, it's, um, a, there's no taxation on it. Mm. And secondly, um, every, every uh, year the company um, can distribute out to 3,600 pounds per employee bonus out um, discarded from the tax. So right. there are definitely financial uh, incentives for the companies to transfer to this model. So essentially, the, you know, all, all the employees end up, re you, you're, you're receiving dividends. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, the, the, the way that it's set up or, or the, the structure um, of the employee ownership model is that um, in the transitioning process, the current owners send, sell their majority stake to the newly formed employee-owned trust entity right. managed by trustee directors. Um, and then the Architecture Limited company um, is the guarantor essentially to that trust and um, they deliver um, the, the work and the day-to-day -day of the business. Um, and the trust then oversees and monitors the operation of that business and the company pays out dividends um, working with the trust. Amazing. Um, I'm really interested actually, what how has it been received by the by the team by the by the employees what what are the sorts of things that are coming up in these collective ambition documents or the or the feedback that you're getting and how how do people want to be involved and what are they contributing i feel like i um the collective ambition document and all sorts of initiatives as I mentioned as aforementioned we have in in the company allows um employees to see what are the decisions being made in the company in the sense what are our ambitions where we want to go mm. what are our strategic um, uh, like forecast and also on the on the let's say financial side it's quite transparent where we are and where we are getting in different regional studios every month um, we have monthly studio meetings where we are being updated from the practice where we are now where we are getting what are our goals and I feel it's quite important to being involved because um, when you have right to information, right, naturally, um, when you know nothing gets hidden from you, you mm -hmm. want to contribute. There is a platform of giving new ideas and new initiatives. Also, I think we are by default promoting very collab collaborative culture. And um, we have very, um, I feel, um, also strong social agenda, uh, engaging with vari various uh, charities, um, and um, 
we also on the, on the social level, we have the annual days out where people from all across different practices globally meet for one, one day and spend time sharing um, past um, projects, sharing accomplishments, but at the same time, building a strong relationship. I think it's really important uh, because in the end of the day, we work on the same projects, right? And we want to push company forward. And it's also quite interesting to learn from different uh, regional studios how, uh, how they are dealing uh, with their offers and where they see uh, um, the company is uh, progressing. Mm -hmm. what, what, what have been or do you view might be some of the uh, obstacles in the transition? in making this model work? I feel it's such a natural progression, like of how Alex said, the main two um, incentives, it's talent retention and succession yeah. planning, right? So technically, um, it's, they are, I would say, only positives to it. It's, it's a democratic way of, um, of running the practice. Mm. And it depends what was the setup before. I think we were already getting there naturally in the way yeah. we run. Also, I think for Parcel, we are in the quite um, lucky position in the, in the sense that um, we don't have founding partners right now running the company. Founding partners, uh, as you uh, mentioned, Donovan Parcel, who founded the company is the for in the 40s. Um, he's no longer with us. So company naturally progressed into being um, organic. The leadership grew organically. Yeah, right? exactly. People who've been there for longer took over the role of leadership. And this is now what's happening again. So I feel it's easier in that, uh, on that model um, um, to introduce open voice and having collaborative culture. Fantastic. I think that was a very good question. I think that was a very good question. Um, and it is difficult to actually identify the obstacles in mm -hmm. the case of Purcell because um, with credit to our board, we have all been included and aware of the process as soon as they were ready to talk to us about it. Yeah. Um, but we do hear other um, less sort of um, positive stories from other organizations in the employee ownership network where um, they got up the next day after a new financial year and they were told, right, um, we just want to let you know that your owners have sold the business to you. You, you now own it. Um, now organize yourselves and get on with it. And the key um, obstacle um, when it does come up is, is probably one around trust and transparency. Um, and um, that, that is one to be aware of for those companies considering transition to EO, that the more you can build that trust and transparency and plant the seeds in the dialogue earlier, Mm. the more you sort of break down any obstacle that might be there because it is a cultural thing. It's a mindset employee ownership. It's not something you just plant on somebody and that's it, off you go. Yeah. Um, and, and it's all around actually supercharging the existing business. So rather than importing things and making them work, what you're trying to do is optimize and maximize all the things that are already really good about a business. Does, does this mean now that the, the type of people that will be joining Purcell need to be of a certain kind of mindset themselves or, or is that kind of inbuilt into your HR and the way that you're attracting people that you're, you're, you will be attracting the right sorts of, right sorts of um, leaders? I think it's a very good question and how I approach it. I think Every person, I think every person wants to work in such an environment. It's mm. not the type of person, right? It's, I, I cannot think of any of my colleagues who wouldn't like to work in the environment when you are giving visibility over decision and you have a right to influence and you can be part of community. I feel it's a human nature to be part of, of, of a bigger picture and have a meaning in your work. It's to see the process, right? And know... Okay why are we doing this? So when you have such a strong why, I feel everyone wants to be in this. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, um, I've been in contact with some companies who've already transformed through Employee Ownership Association, which is a British organization which um, brings together companies uh, which already converted or are during um, process of transition. And um, what I've been told by some companies who already uh, transformed, they say that naturally they feel 
that they um, this whole model is a natural magnet for bringing people who are proactive right. and want to be involved, right? So it brings people with, um, I feel like, a great aptitude. Yeah, because it's kind of, I guess, it, you're naturally more responsible for the business. So mm-hmm. it's it's has it has it meant that there's needed to be a new level of training that's needed for the leadership itself internally because because now you've now you're taking on as as employees now you've got a now you've got a whole load of new um uh, business and leadership responsibilities that perhaps you weren't uh, you, you might not have been thinking about previously yes yeah absolutely um there's been broad sort of briefing and training and engagement and engagement is obviously a vital ingredient of um, growing an employee owned and successfully employee owned business. So that's been running um, on a, on a broad basis from 2016, the leadership of the business has been meeting um, frequently each year um, to have specific briefings on the topic of EO. And then that's run through, um, our employee forum, the Purcell Voice, and then also a, a local studio level. Um, so there's abundant visibility of that. And then as we've moved closer to the transition, which should have taken place in May um, this year, um, the, the preparations got into the detail of appointing the trust board, of which I'm the chair and Eva is a regional trustee, um, where we did then receive very specific training and preparation in governance, business governance, the legal framework that goes with running an employee-owned business um, and all of the sort of financial acumen that we need Mm -hmm. to understand um, as we move into this process. Because although the trust um, has to allow Purcell Architecture Limited and its board to run the business and lead the business, as the majority shareholder as an entity, it has oversight um, and monitoring powers um, to actually govern um, how the business functions, where it takes its investment, how it's performing and so on. So that's been a step change um, in creating this sort of mirror to our current board as the trustee board. Right. Okay. So, so you, you still got, um, you know, you've got people and places and expertise to, to get advice from or to seek ideas and leadership. It's not kind of, you know, it's totally sort of bestowed, bestowed on you. And then you, you, run, you run with it. There's a, there's a set of structures and strategic uh, planning boards that are kind of overseeing things and you're in constant dialogue. Absolutely. Our, our board and our operations board um, are very, um, very clued up on the whole process and have right. provided great guidance um, all the way um, on the whole transitioning of the business to employee ownership. We've then taken external advice um, from um, the legal advisors in actually creating the framework to make this happen. And then, of course, the Employee Ownership Association, an organisation um, in the UK um, that also has a voice beyond, um, that um, is able to sort of provide coaching and guidance. Um, lots of CPD is available. So there's abundant awareness um, mm. of, of how the whole thing is going to come together. And then we've pushed ourselves in, in training each other and working together. And then the trust does also include a non-exec trustee um, right. who's an external advisor that supports um, the trust in its, in its operation um, from an external perspective. So does this mean now that there is a, a kind of a culture of, uh, of the team being much more aware of winning work how work is coming in, you're, you're kind of very clued up on quarterly financial targets and those sorts of things are shared amongst the teams and everyone sort of has a, a shared vision of where the business is going. Yes, and I feel the topic of training, uh, it's, it's very super important. Mm. And as much as we organically promote leadership um, and resilient nature, uh, as such, also Parcel is en- engaging uh, with such trainings internally and externally. Uh, we have the whole leadership uh, tr- um, program within Parcel, where every quarter um, different people are attending um, training program, which is run externally. Uh, the same applies for resilience trainings. And th- those um, programs help you help recognize your weak sites. Right. Uh, how you deal under stress, 
we often being being asked by different colleagues to give us feedback and then we reevaluate our own um, like behaviors dealing with teams and working individually and I feel this self -re reflection helps you to progress better as an individual so as much as we put emphasis on developing technical and design skill set uh, leadership um, and working on our um, um, delegating skills, dealing with team, it's extremely important. And you know, like for instance, every year we have um, annual uh, reviews um, or every half a year actually. And it's interesting when you look at the scores we are getting, it's not only on technical skill set, it's so much about dealing with um, people in your team. How do you I delegate your work? Are you able to let go some things, right? That you, you can't do everything. So the teamwork is, and collaboration, it's super important. And this can be reflected uh, upon the way you are being uh, judged by, by the people in the company. And I think it's important that we on, don't only focus on the feedback from top down, but different people on different um, sectors. We also often ask clients for the feedback, which I think is quite interesting. And by this, we are able to uh, work on us and the profile and as a person, and not only on how great of the designer you are, which is super important to us, right? Mm. But how great of the, the people want to work with you. This is really important to us. Fantastic. How has the, how has the transition, or will, will it affect the way that you work with clients or how will it affect their experience of working with Purcell, if at all, or will it enhance it? I, I don't think it will um, be something that we sort of hard sell and, and will sort of radically change us. Um, there, there's a saying, you know, that um, when you become employee and um, uh, nothing changes, but, but sort of everything changes in a way. And so um, we hope that in that sort of shared sort of um, skin in the game that we have in the business, every employee that we'll all be more feeling more accountable, more responsible, and that that itself will, will provide a better product. Um, you know, the, the levels of productivity in employee owned businesses is um, observed to, um, to improve with, with employee ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it will bring indirectly a better benefit to our, our clients. But by that same token, we will also um, move through the sort of PR gears on this because we hope that in sharing employee ownership and um, our, our sort of uh, vision for that um, is a reflection of us as a company, as a positive company that clients will see a likeness in and yeah. will move towards us and be encouraged by the way in which we're set up and our values. Mm. It's a very stabilizing vision, I suppose, in many ways, like uh, kind of the, the employee owned model sort of presents a business as being, this is a very long term vision that's got long longevity to it. Um, and in terms of, you know, many architecture practices have, have tried lots of different things in their succession plannings and, and sometimes it's difficult to carry a name for, for so long. Uh, whereas this, this model seems like it can, it would be able to navigate a lot of those uh, typically turbulent waters that other businesses face. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, and, and so in terms of, uh, winning winning work and how Purcell goes around um, marketing themselves and acquiring new new clients. Is this something now that the whole team will be at more actively involved in under the employee ownership role or how was it done before? Was it, do you have like kind of uh, in-house marketing teams who are responding to expressions of interests um, and then you're doing competition bids? How, how does the, how does a, a practice of this scale typically win work? Shall I take that one ever? Okay. Um, so um, the common hook is heritage, really. That's mm. what we do and that's what we sell. Um, but there's a lot of sort of grain to that. Um, some of it is um, repairing existing buildings. Some of it's conversion, adaptive reuse. Some of it might be extending an existing building. And then some of it might be pure new build, but within a sort of thorny planning context that right. we're then sort of really adept on. So with that common sort of ability and heritage, we're able to organize, organize ourselves around sectors in quite an agile way that with the common hook of heritage, we can usually 
find a platform in, in any sector, which is great for us as a business because it means we can sort of ebb and flow with need, with economic conditions and the changing landscape of architecture. And so there's almost a sort of comforting con- constant, really, of heritage amongst all that we do that we're then able to sort of adapt and work with in how we win our work. So that's a message that we play on. Right. And we empower everybody to take that message out there, to have the conversations, to win work. Um, and it'll be a combination depending on the sort of sector that we're working through. So public sector is typically um, procurement led, the frameworks, the competitions, the tenders. So we work hard to build the relationships that mean we can then have sight of those opportunities and put in the best bids for those with the best teams. Um, And so that's a strand of our work. We then do a lot of residential private client work um, or private estate work where it's much more about the individual personalities, the skills and those sort of one-on-one conversations that sort of generate the work and make that happen. So in terms of our marketing strategy, it's very diverse. We've got a marketing team. We plug the social media um, yeah. and do the marketing around um, all of our, our different skill sets, really. But it's um, it's a very sort of agile and mobile model. But going back to your point, the encouragement is for everyone to be out there spreading the word and, and winning work. And hopefully EO is great encouragement for that yeah. because the more we generate as a collective, the, the more successful we'll be. Is there, uh, I've heard of businesses in the past when they've moved into the um, employee ownership model and there's a thing called, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's like agents of agents for marketing, right? So you, you produce kind of bits of collateral or a manifesto, for example, which is very easy to communicate your business um, culture amongst the staff and the team because when, once you're able to do that, um, and the team is able to communicate it clearly, it means naturally that they're in conversations out in the world without even meaning to, but they're kind of marketing the business itself. And obviously as an employed ownership thing, there's, there's kind of more to gain if you're actively doing that. Does, the, does Purcell have its own manifesto, if you like, or a constitution that's been developed or has been, is being developed? It, it does. Um... Collective ambition, although it's an internal um, document and strategic business plan, Mm. is very much about articulating and sharing and people being familiar with the practice's ethos and its key messages and what it is then ultimately transferable to the marketplace because at the end of the day, we're here for our clients. So there needs to be a synergy between that document, how we work, how we think. And, and taking that value to our clients. But we do very specifically as well have a constitution, which is um, a new instrument that is actually a key um, component of the suite of documents that form the, the sort of legal transitioning framework of the business as we go into EO. And it's that constitution that is the sort of kernel of it all, really. It's the piece we're protecting. Right. So increasingly, as we go back into the gears of transition to EO, we'll be relaying that constitution again, um, sharing it, making sure people understand it, and that that is there not only for our own sort of security in in what Purcell is, but also something that we can actively sell and remind the marketplace of and why we're here. Are you able to share any of the sort of pieces or the flavour of what's inside of that, that document? I can't talk about any specifics yet purely because of the, um, the sort of stall that we've had with yes. COVID. Um, so I, I ought not to relay that as it's not gone in its final version to our staff yet. No worries. No worries. Okay. Good question. <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> um, Could I attach, sorry, based on a winning work? Slightly. Yes. Yeah, please. So um, in, in regards to winning work, uh, let's don't underestimate um, the power of having meaning, meaningful relationships and sustaining them. Like so much of our work is a repeat work. And right. for us, it's super important that clients are satisfied with, um, with the projects we are currently delivering and then work of mouth. And as much as you are, for instance, a part two, right? After studies, uh, obviously you are not able to bring 40 million scheme to such a big project uh, company as Parcel. Mm. However, you are able to... Uh, 
sustain great relationships with everybody you work with, with the clients. And by, I think, displaying um, this attitude and caring about delivering great work, you are indirectly um, winning work, I think, future work. So uh, this whole idea of that only partners are able to bring new projects, how it used to be, I think, back in the day, um, it's, it's obviously, it's not that black and white, right? I think every person on different level and different age of their career is able to directly or indirectly um, bring projects. It's also about showing up. We are encouraging people on all level to attend various um, industry events. We are obviously uh, uh, present at MIPIM, but we are also going on a lot of design creeds with the university and various different um, industry events. So I think it's, it's, it's a quite a complex um, um, uh, tree of, uh, of sustaining the relationships and building new ones. Brilliant. Um, I suppose we can't not talk about the pesky virus that's impacted everybody. And obviously it's kind of had a major delay to um, you know, your, your business's transition um and you know, the, the the move over how else how have you been coping how have you how's the business adapted particularly a, a practice of of that size um how has it impacted you and how have you been how have you been working around it you know what's been great during this time um i think it's a lot about communication mm. and as hard it's been for like every business undoubtedly around the globe in every place of, of the world and as we are such a big business and we were not able obviously to physically meet and discuss, we've been um, in direct contact with the board, like board in the beginning of the whole situation has been releasing daily uh, statements. And now we've been updating every week, every month. We have set of webinars um, where we have a direct messaging from the board, but also in the written form, which I think is a quite reassuring um, and comforting um, communication to have. That you know that um, the people who run the practice meet more often than they usually would, and that they are coping with so many difficult strategic decisions, and you are part of this dialogue, and I think it enhances the feeling that we are in, in all of it together. Amazing, and and I suppose the the everybody's been working at home, all the offices. Uh, you know, you've kind of had to go through whatever nightmare it has been in terms of getting everyone's IT up and running and and working. Is there is there a, a vision to keep the kind of home working as a, sort of a major part of the practice, or are you all kind of itching to get back into the offices and and work back as, as studios again? So um, during the the summer period, our um, HR team with the board conducted a survey. Um, with with the employees on um, thoughts on home working, flexible work in the future. We've had a, a build back better strategy developing like most businesses have, um, which is going well. And we're due to have sight of a new flexible working policy um, very soon. So um, clearly we've all realised a lot of the benefits of the home working, the flexibility and and in a way, it's it's kept the business sort of functioning with our clients when without this technology, um, things could have been a lot, lot worse. So we're thankful for that. So there is going to be a different sort of positive, flexible mood and, and feel continuing, you know, beyond the virus, which is great. Um, but clearly, which um, I've certainly noticed amongst our team and beyond that there's still that thirst to get back into the studios to be back face to face, talking together, working together. Um, it's those chance discussions, the seeing over someone's shoulder, the join they're working th from and saying, oh, that looks great if you thought about this. Those kinds of discussions are the things that we're all missing yeah. and that the, the virus is still sort of keeping us from doing in many ways. And I happen to be in the studio today, but, but otherwise it's pretty much empty, which is a real shame. But mm. um, hopefully we'll come out of this with a blend of, of a work life sort of existence and balance that, that suits people in the right ways. But I, I don't think there's any hesitation that we wouldn't want to be back in the studios in some form as soon as it's safe to do so. 
How, how have you tried to um, manufacture some of that kind of spontaneous social connection with amongst the team? We, we still carry on with our virtual socials, <laughs> believe us or not. So I feel we are still quite well connected. And in the way, perhaps it sounds quite uh, controversial, but I think we are really lucky um, with our profession as architecture. Mm. Uh, because what I feel is about build environment that people who I know who work in build environment tend to really love their job. Uh, we have aim beyond just delivering work now. It's this... We, I think we believe that the architecture is an expression of human uh, existence mm -hmm. and there is higher aim to it. So I feel this helps us to be resilient because you can see your goal past this moment in time. And I feel this collective um, feeling and knowing that our work um, and our skill set can be applied for so many more generations, right? It's not only about now. Help helps us to stay resilient and see the brighter future, I feel. Beautiful. Amazing. And, and to finish up on, to conclude our conversation, what are, what are you both working on for the rest of the rest of 2020 project wise? Um, so I, as, as aforementioned, I'm still working on the two regeneration schemes in London. So uh, obviously it's, uh, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite challenging now because we are all working uh, separately, right? We, we can't see each other. It's also quite challenging for me uh, because one of my projects is on site. And normally I would go at least once a month and uh, have site inspections. So now we have this setup with the client when ev every Tuesday morning I'm getting a bunch of photos from the site uh, that we comment on and have uh, the design meetings uh, over Zoom. Uh, but I've also already experienced having pre-planning uh, meetings uh, with the council in London over uh, Zoom and it worked. It was successful. So yeah, we take advantage of it and we just keep carrying on. Fantastic. So my, um, my projects um, are sort of revolving around cultural sector and private residential at the moment, which um, while well, we've seen sort of prime residential and um, the sort of properties that Purcell work on, um, sort of keeping going through this period um, and still presenting great opportunities. Um, the cultural sector has obviously taken a real harsh yeah. hit from, from the pandemic and the income that would normally be generated by visitors. So um, quite a bit of my work down to Christmas is helping organisations um, just remain stable, really. There's packages of works coming through from the government and similar agencies that are providing sort of buoyancy aid monies to organisations, museums, trusts, national trust, and similar. So I'll be working with clients of, um, of that ilk, really, just to help remain stable and plan um, monies to tackle urgent maintenance need, and then some of it for strategic planning to help them reorganise how they function in this sort of post-virus world that we'll eventually find ourselves in. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, I think that's the, the, the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. Thank you both so much for your insights and for sharing with such transparency um, the culture of Purcell and, and its transition. And I really look forward to actually uh, speaking with you again post-transition to, to hear how it's kind of unfolded and the, and the changes that it's, um, that, it's, that it's facilitated within the business and the, and the continued success of your the company. So thank you. Thank you. It'd be fantastic to do that. Brilliant. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for your time. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.